there's one thing about the graph on the left which I didn't mention in the previous video. We said that the that under attacks the total abatement cost paid by firm one is going to be the area under OX. And the total abatement cost paid by firm three under the tax is going to be the area under OY. And you might ask, this doesn't seem fair. The area under OX seems to be, and I think it is, a lot smaller than the area under OY. Firm one, who's the quote-unquote dirty firm, the firm that finds it difficult to abate pollution, therefore under the tax gets by with paying very little money in abatement cost. Whereas firm three, which is the cleaner firm, the firm that finds abatement cheaper, ends up paying a lot more money than firm one does in abatement cost. And even setting aside the question of whether this is fair or unfair, that the quote-unquote cleaner firm ends up paying more money, there's a, a question of dynamic incentives. As time goes on, firms can change their MAC curve. The well, firm one could adopt newer technology and become more like firm three, Firm 3 could presumably adopt older technology and become more like Firm 1. And it would appear if you, and this is, the, this is actually not the right way to look at it, but if, it would appear if you looked at it by just looking at total abatement cost, that what would happen is Firm 3 would have an incentive as time goes on to become more like Firm 1, in other words, to become dirtier in order to escape having to pay such large abatement costs, or escape the situation in which firm three chooses to go to point Y and therefore pays higher abatement costs. Now, the reason that's not the right way to think about things is because that's only looking at abatement costs. You need to look at the whole picture. The whole picture includes both abatement costs and taxes. The amount of taxes that firm one pays, since it only abates S1, is the area under the tax line from S1 all the way to the zero pollution level. So from one is paying, maybe I'll, I'll enclose the entire area. From one is paying all of this the area under OX is an abatement cost, and the area under X and, oh, let me give this a name. The area under XZ are the taxes. From three is paying the area under OY in abatement costs, but in taxes, from three is only paying YZ. And so the total amount of money that firm three is paying, if you add the abatement cost of the taxes, is this. So now you can see that that actually is better to be firm three than to be firm one, when you take both taxes and abatement costs into account. And therefore, setting up taxes gives an incentive for firm one to become more like firm three. And no incentive for firm three to become more like firm one. And since firm three is the quote unquote cleaner firm and firm one is a dirtier firm, this is another advantage of the tax system. And now with standards, I, I, I suppose we could say a few things about standards. Um, Let's see. With standards, there are no taxes. Firm 1 is paying the area under OA, and Firm 3 is paying the area under OC. So with the standard, 
there's similarly an incentive for firm one to become firm three. So although that was a good feature of the taxes, that firm one wanted to become more like firm three over time, that is also a feature of the standard. Okay, I'm going to pause for a minute here to write up some other uh, general comments now about taxes versus standards that um, that aren't anymore in the two firm framework. There is one caveat to what I said about the fact that both the standard and the tax give incentives for the firm to want to get quote unquote cleaner over time. Let's think about the way that that the socially optimal level of abatement was originally decided. We had an MAC curve and we had an MEC curve. Remember, uh, since we're using abatement on the horizontal axis rather than output, the MEC curve is downward sloping rather than upward sloping. And the socially optimal level of abatement, I'll call it a star, is given by that level. And and that effect that, that would affect um, both the standard, which which tells you how much abatement each firm needs to undertake, or the tax that gets you the same amount of level as that as that standard does. And the thing is that as t if as time goes on, firms decide to become cleaner because that saves them money, then what you have over time is a shift of the MAC curve down to represent lower costs. Now, that does save the firm's money as they planned. If the government sees this diagram and doesn't adjust a star, but if the point of the government is to ensure that the socially optimal level of abatement is undertaken, then when the MAC curve goes down because abatement now has become cheaper, a star is going to go up. The new value of a star, a star new, is higher. Abatement's gotten cheaper, so it's socially optimal to engage in more abatement. Well, the simple story would be, okay, so when the, the firms become cleaner, the government sees that MAC has shifted down to MAC prime, and so the government switches to a new value of abatement. The problem comes when the firms can anticipate that. If the firms can anticipate that when they do the right thing or the the, the kind of a greener thing and adopt newer technology that moves MAC down, then the government is going to respond by making them do forcing them to do more abatement, either by making the standards stricter or by making the tax on non abatement higher than that it reminds me of the saying, no good deed goes unpunished. And to the extent that they can foresee that this is the way the government is going to react, they are, they'll refrain from trying to make their MAC curve move down, or at least refrain from trying to make their MAC curve move down as much as if they didn't anticipate this or if the government just kept a, was it going to just keep A star at its original level? So we have what an economist is called a game now between the polluting firms and the government. And depending on which what what they think the other is going to do, you get different outcomes. Um, for example, the government could try to alleviate this problem 
by committing itself to keeping a star at the old level for a certain amount of time. And then the question is, is the government making a credible commitment to do that? Uh, so we, we can't really get into game theory here, but it does raise questions of these incentives over time, the dynamics, and the different kind of, of strategies. Now, thinking about strategies, I want to go back to, to this, the simpler model, where we just had output as proportional to pollution. This, uh, this symbol means pr proportional to. So we had M and PB, MEC, dollars per unit. So this is what we were doing in previous chapters. MEC is rising because we have a proportional p to pollution on the horizontal axis. So the optimal amount of output is Q star. Let's say you enforce this with a standard. Then the law that you would pass would say that producing more than Q star units of output is illegal. So this is the illegal zone. Now, if firms always obey the law, there's really nothing else to say. The firm will go to Q star and end the story. But firms don't always obey the law, and people do think about what incentives they might face to disobey the law and what punishment might be the consequence if they get caught. So, and in the U.S., most of the consequences for, for illegal behavior as far as violating environmental protection laws are civil punishments, which are fines. In other words, you have to give up a certain amount of money. Now, the Environmental Protection Agency does actually have a criminal division. It's pretty small, but there are uh, there are certain environmental crimes that actually can result in putting people in jail. And some years ago, the Salt Lake Tribune had an interesting article about. I think he was the only. Um, it, employee of the Federal Environmental Protection Agency in Utah who was charged with doing criminal investigations. And there was a case of a small businessman in Utah County who had deliberately and over, uh, I don't know if it was quite some years, but, but several times, uh, discharged some kind of toxic substance, it might have been used motor oil or something having to do with automobiles, into, uh, into a storm drain, which then you know goes directly into the environment. And apparently he had been warned, and he still did it. So the EPA actually filed a, a, uh, a criminal complaint against him. And he ended up fleeing the state, uh, moving to Florida. The EPA coordinated with, I think, the FBI and the U U.S. Marshal Service. They found him in Florida. They, they engaged in one of these raids, kind of like what you see on TV shows. There were firearms involved. Um, they finally arrested him, and he was thrown into prison for violating environmental protection laws. So, so that can happen. But the vast majority of environmental regulations are handled with civil punishments. So what I want to ask is, uh, 
what are the f what fine is involved if you do the illegal activity suppose the fine is this level let's say fine number one well what the firm could do is consider the fine just the cost of doing business decide to engage in an illegal level of output to here, this level of Q, and figure, well, if it get, gets caught, it'll just pay the fine. You see, the fine then functions like a tax with the following difference. The firm would go to the point I indicated if it knew that it would get caught if every time it disobeyed the law. That's then the fine just functions as a tax. However, if it thought it would only get caught, let's say, fifty percent of the time, then the then the actual fine is not like a tax, it's like half of a tax. Because half of the time you don't have to pay anything. And so then the actual level would get even closer to to q pi or it might actually equal q pi you know for example if it thought it would only get caught five percent of the time maybe then it would go um well actually it wouldn't go all the way to q pi because the fine never goes all the way to zero but if you know it the it the it the fine taking into account the probability is really really small then you get this is q pi here then you get really close to q pi So the government looks at this and says, well, we don't want the firms to be doing this. So what we're going to have to do is increase the fine. We can increase the fine to this. And then if the firm was going to get caught every single time it violated the law, then fine number two would act just like a tax and the firm will want to go to here and that's q star which is great because that's where we want the firm to go but suppose we want the firm to go to q star and we know that the firm is only going to get caught 50 percent of the time it violates the law or 10 percent of the time it violates the law well then in order to induce behavior closer to q star you'd have to have a much higher fine like fine number three because the effective fine is fine number three when you get caught and zero if you don't get caught. So the effective fine isn't fine number three, but something lower than that. And you have to set fine number three and set the amount of money you spend on enforcement appropriately to get the firm overall to decide to go to Q star. So in this sense, you know, before we treated the standard and the tax as being totally different things, but are they really? If if the punishment from violating the standard is a is a fine, and the fine functions kind of like a tax, then maybe there isn't uh, much of a difference between the the fine and or I mean I'm sorry the 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 tax and the standard. As much difference as as we thought. Um, a couple of quick general comments. Let's talk about evasion. So taxes versus standards. Do they differ in terms of evasion? Now we've been talking about evading the standard. Of course you can also evade a tax. Uh, and um, it's not really obvious to me that a tax versus a standard is that one of them is better in terms of evasion than the other um, it depends on the amount of monitoring that you do uh, the, the amount of monitoring that the government does with the standard the government uh, 
perhaps has a simpler job in monitoring. It just has to know whether the standard is being violated or not. Whereas with the tax, the government has to know not just how much pollution, not just whether pollution is greater than or less than a certain amount, but exactly how much pollution there is. Or not just that abatement is greater than or equal to greater than or less than a certain amount, but exactly how much how much abatement there is. So measurement might be more difficult for taxes than for standards. Measurement might be more costly, uh, but I don't think so. I guess I should write that down. So that's uh, enforcement costs. So enforcement costs might be higher for taxes because you have to measure more precisely. Also, with taxes, you need to collect money. And I did the money collection. And that brings with it its own set of problems. You have to track the money. You have to make sure that the money goes uh, goes from the appropriate people to the appropriate people and so forth whereas uh, the standard doesn't involve money unless there are fines so let's forget about them because we just we already talked about them the standard doesn't involve money so it might be it might have lower enforcement costs might be simpler to administer uh, enforcement costs this is also ad administration costs administrative costs Um, so those might be advantages for advantages for the standards. In other words, the enforcement costs for standards might be lower because in taxes you have to identify exactly how much pollution or abatement there is. And administrative costs might be higher for taxes because you have all the costs involved in money collection and accounting. In terms of calculating the optimal level of abatement or optimal level of output, these problems are exactly the same, taxes versus standards. You calculate A star or Q star first, and then you decide to impose either a standard or a tax in order to get to A star or Q star. So it can be complicated to calculate A star and Q star, it usually is, but that really doesn't have anything to do with taxes versus standards. Okay, I think I'll stop here. Next, actually, we're going to revisit box 12.1.